Okay, we can start, John, if you're okay. Okay, thanks, Philippe. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us uh, today. Um, please note the, the list of clever people uh, I've got here, all of them friends to boot. And uh, I should say Mike in particular, who's led me into the, the head-blowing world of, of geodynamics uh, over recent years. To go forward, Philip, I'm not getting any activation on this. So what's the... I don't know if you uh, use your, uh, these are your keyboards, I mean, the um, uh, arrows on your keyboards or maybe uh, with your mouse. If yeah, you click on keyboard, it. keyboard doesn't work. Ah, uh, this will do. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, this will do, I just clicked. Okay. Yeah, so as many of you will know, um, we suffered a big loss last month and uh, I want to dedicate this talk to a, an important person for me, Professor Paul Bishop. A uh, great mentor and friend, um, and he'll be he'll be sadly missed. So, in the last decade or so, we've seen a growing interest in the idea that rivers encode information about long-term changes in topography linked to deep earth processes. For ancient drainage systems on cratons, especially, there's potential to record mantle-driven deformation otherwise leaves few geophysical traces in the terrestrial record. Now, Australia, as you can see here, rides on a plate that's rocketing north at around 70 kilometres per million years. That's seven centimetres per year. And it's been doing so for about the last 40 million years. The plate's motion is driven mainly by the pull exerted by the subduction zones uh, in the Sunda Trench, and it's resisted by the collisions in the three surrounding origins, uh, the Himalayas, the uh, PNG, Papua New Guinea here, and uh, New Zealand there. Now today I'll convince, I'll attempt to convince you that this speedy plate motion has some important upshots for the geomorphology of the Australian continent and central oils in particular. Now I'll begin with uh, flattering myself by saying that this forms a counterpart to Dirk Scheller's blockbuster talk back in November. Now Dirk focused on the crash zone up here where uh, Cosmo derived erosion rates are of the order of 10 to the four um, meters per million. And yeah, well, one of these things is, is not like the other. Erosion rates in parts of central Oz are down to order 10 to the negative one uh, meters per million. That's just a millimeter or two per 10,000 years. And that's average at the catchment scale. And I'll talk a little bit about Cosmo uh, later on. So fast, plation, fast plate motion means, what are some of the consequences of a speedy plate? And let's take them one by one. Dynamic topography, or DT, is the topography we observe at Earth's surface resulting from the convective flow in the mantle. Now, fast plate motion means rapid response to dynamic to perturbations, um, such as when you ride over a, a ride fast over a speed bump on the road. Dynamic topography has been raised as an explanation for the Lake Air Basin uh, shown here. That's a 1.1 million square kilometer internally drained catchment. The bottoms are around 15 meters below sea level. And the basin is outlined here by that uh, in black line. Now, a recent study links this big topographic depression to a slab of crust that broke off New Guinea in the north and is now sucking down the lithosphere as it sinks into the mantle. Now, according to this hypothesis, the depression is migrating south in pace with plate motion. And so the associated deficits should get younger as you move south. Now, one problem uh, is that the Pliocene precursor to Lake Eyre, which is here, Paleo Lake Villa Kalina, 
lies to the south of the present depot center at Lake Eyre. So this suggests a kind of oscillation process and perhaps that DT is not the full story. Now I'll return to this idea of, of oscillations a little bit later. Second, a fast plate can migrate into new climate zones. Now global cooling since the mid Miocene climate optimum has been amplified in Australia by the rise of the belt of subtropical uh, high pressure systems, which now sits at around 30 degrees south. So most of the continent is pretty arid. And I think it's fair to say that a lot of Central Australia's geomorphology to date has been attributed to this intensified post Miocene aridity. Now, this is in tune, I think, with the idea of Australia as the archetypal stable continent, but I think that misses some important issues. And thirdly, changes to horizontal or in-plane stresses. When we look at the in-situ stress field indicated here in grey across the continent, we can see that the max horizontal compressive stress is mostly at a high angle to plate motion. Now this compressive stress seems to be driving low amplitude topographic undulations across the continent. For instance, gentle folding steers the Cooper Creek for around 700 kilometers before it cuts the inner Minka Dome around here, which you know, rises in its path. And a few years ago, using Cosmo and Luminescence, we came up with estimates of the uplift and uh, and subsidence uh, shown across here. The sources of the in-plane stress is thought to be either collisions going on at the plate boundary or mantle drag causing tractions at the base of the plate. And both of these factors potentially stem from uh, speed plate motion. So it's worth asking, why do these low to moderate in-plane stresses matter much anyway? Well, Australia is the flattest continent. This means erosion is slow and that the geomorphic memory of events is also very long. It's, it's so flat that even small amounts of, of surface deformation can reverse drainage and create internal basins. And, and we see examples of this uh, right across the continent. So in light of that, Perhaps the most important effect of changing in plane stresses is that it can alter the flexural response to vertical loads embedded in the lithosphere. And we can see this potential energy in the gravity field, as I'm showing here in this plot. Now, these gravity anomalies are among the largest preserved in intraplate settings globally inside this uh, white box. Now, this northern blue blob relates to the Alice Springs orogeny, which is an intraplate origin that dates back to the mid Paleozoic. Looking more closely now, the remarkable thing is that the surface drainage patterns and indeed the Lake Eyre Basin divide itself, that's this line here, that's the Lake Eyre Basin divide, seems to follow the patterns and, and overall, the rivers drain toward the gravity highs and away from or across the gravity lows. And from this, we can infer that the flexural response to the uncompensated loads, that's what we're seeing in the gravity, has somehow modified the topography. Now this north-south swath profile shows this really nicely. The topography very much correlates inversely with the gravity. And the Alice Springs origin, well, here we see a view of the Amadeus Basin foreland associated with the origin. And this is what 300 million years does to an origin. Amazingly, at least to me, is that the foreland relief out here is higher than the origin itself, which is pretty much as flat as a tack. And this is much as, we've, as we also find in, uh, in the Appalachians. 
So zooming in a little more, thanks to a Google Earth image, you can see the Fink River here flowing from the, the edge of the thrust zone south across the, the foreland. The Fink River is said to be among the oldest drainage basins in the world based on its antecedents or supposed antecedents to these old structures. And when we started working on the Fink in 2015, Mike alerted us to the idea that because of its antiquity and position relative to these gigantic uh, gravity anomalies, the Fink might record some signal of deep earth processes. And I think it turns out he's right. There are some aspects of this river's history that are a bit unusual. Just in here, the Fink forms a series of spectacular sinuous gorges over about 30 kilometres, where it dissects the, uh, the foreland uh, cut across the Amadeus, Amadeus Basin. Now, what's unusual here is that there are actually two gorges intertwining, the present day Think Gorge and a slightly less incised Pallier Valley with hanging junctions 10 to 20 metres high. Now, these Pallier Valley cutoffs have been known for decades, but the overprinting of the two gorges has remained difficult to explain. Here they are from uh, a DEM. How does this happen? I've never really seen anything like this before in a non-glaciated landscape, and I'd be really keen to, to hear if anyone knows of, of something similar. The Paleo Valley floors are lined with gravel up to a few metres thick, and they're made up of locally derived sandstone class plus quartzite class here, traceable to outcrops in the headwaters known as the heavy tree formation. And that's around 50 kilometres to the north of, of these sides. In the Paleo Valley, some exposures show partially disintegrated conglomerates locked together with a mixture of siliceous and ferruginous ferruginous sediment, you can see fragments of those behind Toshi here. And although the quartzite is strong, many of the class like this example uh, are shattered into fragments, implying these class have been sitting in this valley for a long time. Now I think there are two clues to what's going on here. As well as lining the modern gorge, these quartzite gravels are strewn across the hill slopes up to 80 metres above the gorge floor. And I've shown that in this plot here in the area shaded with grey up to these areas here. And two, neither of the intertwined gorges contain strapped terraces or steps on the concave bend, so which would suggest some kind of punctuated uh, incision. So from this, I think we can surmise that the proto-fink was up to say 2.5 kilometers wide prior to incision of Paleo Valley, that's incision one. And then at some point later, the entire valley floor was alluviated and filled with gravels that blanketed and obscured the Paleo Valley, allowing the elevated channel to migrate laterally across the underlying uh, bedrock loops. This was followed by carving of a, of a 200 metre wide gorge seen today, and that's incision two, and that's the one we see in the, uh, the orange here. So in this sense, the present day gorge is a classic epigenetic gorge. And here's uh, Bill Riemann's neat figure to illustrate an example in Utah, We've got alluviation of the valley floor, lateral migration of the channel, and then reincision into another place. But where the Fink differs from Weimann's example is that the intertwined gorges have the same channel sinuosity, the same width, and the same reach slope, though slope is difficult to reconstruct for the Paleo Valley because it's, they're rather fragmented and they're shown here uh, in these, uh, this reconstructed regression here. Bed load calibre, well, it's not easy to say, but the size ranges we observe in the Paleo Valley seem no different at 
least uh, qualitatively, to those in the modern channel. Now, this suggests that the old and the new gorges were shaped by a similar discharge and sediment load regimes. And so to me, this seems a pretty strong mark against the role of climate uh, as a driver of these events. I should say, yes, this is clearly a, a schematic cross-section of, of the Paleo Valley cutoffs and the Fink Gorge uh, here. Nick points, well, you'd think there would be some given the, the changes that are afoot. The bed profile looks pretty linear over more than 80 kilometres, and it seems that nick points, if they did exist, uh, have now diffused away or lie buried, and that's a possibility as we have no idea of the depth of the valley fill underneath the modern Fink here. The timing of events, well, that's of course the big question. And to establish the timing, we apply cosmogenic nuclides. I know Dieck did such a superb job of, of introducing Cosmo in his November talk. And I, because of this uh, being the counterpart to his talk, I'm going to suggest you consult his. But the basics of this, terrestrial cosmogenic nuclides such as beryllium and aluminium are produced in minerals in the upper few meters of the surface by interactions of high energy particles, uh, mainly neutrons and muons, and they're formed in these nuclear cascades from, from the top of the atmosphere. Nuclear production uh, at three kilometers is about 10 times what it is at sea level, it's shown in this neat figure from Greg Balco, and production rate attenuates rapidly below the surface. So roughly 80% of the nuclides are produced in the upper two meters. So note this vertical scale is, is really very different. So we collected surface samples from the remnants of the gravel piles that once filled the Paleo Valley, plus samples from the modern channel bed. And you can see the sites, of the sample collections uh, indicated by these open circles, and a couple from the modern, from the modern channel. Now our aim was to determine their depositional age because because that would give us the minimum age for the Paleo Valley itself and a maximum age for incision of the epigenetic gorge. Also, the rate of exhumation of the gravel pile had to be in pace with the incision of the epigenetic gorge, because of course the Paleo Channel is, the well, Paleo Valley is a, a cutoff, and so the gravels have to have somewhere to go they have to go out by the, the epigenetic gorge. So keep in mind that these gravels were once buried by 40 to 60 meters deep uh, inside the gravel piles. The nuclides measured in the gravels are a function of, of three factors. Their erosional history in the sediment source area around 50 kilometers up the stream, their exposure on hill slopes and in the streams during transport, and taken together, that's their pre burial inventory. That, that's the atoms that the gravels arrive with when they come to the Paleo Valley. And three, the burial time and exhumation uh, in the gravel pile itself. Now, as folks in, uh, from all of us like to do, we used a Markov chain Monte Carlo based inversion model to simulate the pathway of our gravels from source to sink. Now, this is a system of, of forward models that compute iteratively the uh, abundances of 10 and 26, subject to variations in model parameters, followed by inversion. And to frame our inversion modeling, we proposed two limiting case scenarios, recognizing, of course, that quite possibly, reality may have combined some combination of, of both of these. So we have the first one, a short burial exhumation in which the gravel piles were exhumed at a steady rate, so fixed erosion, during incision of the epigenetic gorge. In this case, 
because it's a short uh, burial, some fraction of the pre-burial inventory is preserved. And deep within the gravel piles, the 26-10 ratio declines because, as we know, aluminium 26 decays faster than beryllium 10. Now we parameterize this model starting with the initial concentrations of beryllium 10 and aluminium 26. The burial time within the gravel pile T1 and the onset of exhumation of the gravel pile T2 and a steady exhumation rate is assumed from T2 to the present day. And the second case, a long-term scenario in which burial has been so lengthy that the pre-burial inventory, that's the atoms that the gravels arrived with, has decayed to less than 5%. So here at T2, samples start with zero nuclides. And as the gravel pile arose, so new 26 and 10 atoms are produced in the upper few meters of the surface. So think Lagrangian, the surface is coming to them. So in this case, the gravel piles can erode at either steady or unsteady rates. And that's shown by uh, this array of different erosion rates over different time intervals. Um, discretized into five or four uh, periods. And this means that a lower ratio of aluminium 26 to beryllium 10 can be explained by samples accelerating to the surface via, via for instance, gullying. That's an important point to remember. So what do we get? Well, with scenario A, Burial in the gravel piles was short enough to retain some of the pre-burial nuclides from the source area. So exhumation times are generally longer than burial. And the onset of erosion of the gravel pile and the incision of the epigenetic gorge started at around after about say 0.7 million, but maybe as early as say 1 million, uh, according to sample C1. Now, Overall, for this model setup, we need to fill the Paleo Valley up and then erode it down again while incising uh, a bedrock gorge, all within the past million years. And carving an 80 metre deep bedrock gorge after 0.6 million years demands an average incision rate of about 130 metres per minute. Now we think that's just too fast, especially given that we know the bedrock ridges that supply the, the gravels, the quartzite gravels from the heavy tree formation, they're eroding at very slow rates in the order of 0 0.2 to, so 0 0.2 to 3 meters per million. So the rates here suggest another world. So we settle on scenario B, the multi-million million year time scale of burial and exhumation in paleo valleys. Now here, the nuclide memory in the gravels was essentially erased because they were deeply buried for so long. Unfortunately, all we can say from this set of outcomes is the, is the minimum age of the Paleo Valley fills. So for scenario B here, you can see that the final 10 meters of the exhumation pathways to the surface of the gravel piles. Sample C1 in particular shows or suggests some acceleration on the upper two meters in line with its lower 26-10 uh, ratio. But do keep in mind though that, that these, surface, these are surface samples only. And we didn't dig pits into these and get depth profiles, although had we gone back, we certainly would do now. We don't have much information to constrain the exhumation rates down deep. Now, there are two aspects about all this that's striking, I think, in the context of, of Central Oz. There's the amplitude of the fluvial incision aggradation. Now, this is a lot for, for this landscape. And the magnitude of the shifts in the sediment transport capacity implied by this switch between incision and aggradation, this is not something we see much in this landscape. 
Let's arc back now to our in-plane stresses. So we need a mechanism that can drive over a few millions of years. Paleo Valley incision, well, could be steepening. Paleo Valley filling, something that impedes the transport capacity, and not just a bit, we've got to, we've got to achieve 50 meters of, of valley floor aggradation, so say back tilting. And then epigenetic gorge incision, for which we presumably need steepening again. So to and fro tilting of the upper, upper think is plausible. And thanks to given what we know about the, what we can expect to be the moderate horizontal loading. And this is in the order of one to two uh, by 10 to the 12 newtons per meter. And the amplitude of the wavelength of these topographic topographic variations is consistent with an effective elastic thickness of about 30 kilometers. So what have we learned? Intertwined bedrock valleys are rare in non-glacial settings. And this example in the Fink has provided, I think a long lasting enigma going back more than a century. It's a reminder, I think, that flat landscapes can be perturbed quite dramatically by even a little bit of nudging from below. And as noted by Rob Mooker in 2008, there's no such thing as a stable continental platform. Thinking about um, eroding flat landscapes, there's a two or three orders of magnitude variation cosmo-derived erosion rates when we look at flat landscapes. And for a long time, I was convinced that uh, we were seeing, what we were seeing there was an erodibility signal, difference in mythology, substrate strength. But now I'm thinking a little bit differently. I think it would be very interesting to look for signs of lithosphere uh, flexure as, as we've shown here uh, in those data. Here I've tried to show that the geomorphology of uh, the Central Oz retains the legacy of a Paleozoic intraplate origin coupled with fast plate motion. And this legacy is seen in the history of fluctuating incision aggradation phases driven by flexural responses to transient in-plane stresses. And this is all uh, possible due to the presence of these very high or extreme uh, uncom uncompensated loads that we see in the gravity. Long burial of the gravels in Fink's uh, Paleo Valley erased the nuclide memory of the sediment source just 50 kilometers upstream. And the gorge overprinting occurred over a multi million year time scale, that probably predates the quaternary. Post-Miocene con continental aridification, uh, I think played a secondary role. And that's not to say that it, it wasn't important, but I think it's in previous work, there's been a, a little bit of a, a blind spot to the effects of, of uh, lithospheric flexure and deformation in general on, on these processes. So um, thank you for listening to this, if uh, none of this makes any sense to you, um, please feel free to consult the paper that's associated with this talk. It's uh, just listed there below, just uh, accepted. And uh, uh, last of all, thank, uh, I must say that we uh, sincerely acknowledge the traditional owners of this country, the area in which uh, this study has been um, discussed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, for, for this talk. Thank you. Uh, so yes, the chat is open for questions. So, so do not hesitate to, uh, to ask questions using the chat. Uh, you can also use, uh, as we said, um, uh, you can raise your hand to, uh, to directly ask questions with the mic, with the mic sorry. Um, and uh, yes, we will uh, ask the question together with, uh, with Pierre and Rebecca. Uh, so I have just a, a very uh, short first question to, to you, John. Uh, what should be the, uh, the, the evidences that we should look for 
if we are looking for similar uh, histories on other plates that are moving at a fa fast rate, what would be the, uh, I mean, the best uh, location or the best uh, evidence is to, to spot this kind of uh, um, uh, flexural response or to, uh, to moving, uh, to fast moving plates? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Well, I mean, we really lucked upon the, the Think Gorge site. It was a site that was pretty famous among geomorphologists. People have been structuring their heads about it for a long time. It has the fills, of course, so it had sediment that could be dated. That, of course, is a pretty fundamental uh, first step. You need something that you can establish a chronology with, even though we were pretty unsuccessful at that. So alluvial fills are, are what you would look for to begin with. And also, of course, perhaps signs of uh, drainage rearrangements. And this is something that Greg Rutenick, who I listed in the list of uh, contributors here, and he's a, a new postdoc with us in Prague. Greg and Mark and I are working on actually using uh, chi maps to identify areas of instability in catchment boundaries and perhaps even to identify sites that we can investigate uh, in future uh, for exactly these kinds of uh, lithospheric flexure uh, events. Um, so I think uh, while Australia is probably one of the fastest uh, plates, the plate that it's riding on at least, I think um, we, and of course that gives us the transient in-plane stresses that you know, have basically led to these events. Um, flat landscapes anywhere could be subject to these kinds of kinds of events, I think. Okay, thank you. I don't know, Pierre or Rebecca, if you have some, uh, some questions as well. Yeah, I, I do. Thank, thanks a lot, John. I just have a question by curiosity. I mean, looking at the, the outcrop pictures that you've shown, especially this, uh, the grain size of the deposit. I mean, it looks like really pebbles that you have in a low relief area on around like 50 kilometers from the source. So is it something that you see in the current like a river, it's this kind of granulometry being transported away or is it something that is typical from these uh, deposits, old deposits? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks Pierre. Yeah, looking at the, the sedimentology within the, the Paleo Valleys, well, you know, we're looking at a pile of sediment that's only three meters, two meters thick. It used to be 50 meters thick. So what we're seeing is probably a pretty skewed representation of what may have been in it. But yeah, we do see largely cobble size material and then finer grain material, which could actually be Eolian and probably is. But when we look at the modern channel, it's pretty similar. We've got a mixture of sand and up to cobble sizes. There's a little bit of bouldery material, but probably that's coming from the slope, so close by. We didn't measure the bed load calibre formally, but qualitatively at least, it looks like the, the bed load material is pretty consistent between the modern channel and paleo channel. I mean, there's no water in the Fink for most of the time. The thing flows maybe every few years and maybe every 20 or 30 years, there's a really big flood and that's where most of the geomorphic work is done. So, and based on the, the overall slope, which is around 1.3 metres per um, kilometre, so that's uh, 0.0013, I mean, that's not that... That's fairly steep, actually. So I would believe, you know, with a sizable river, of, you know, a river of this size, I think it's, a, um, I think it's about four thousand kilometers square at that point. You would have enough discharge to move that bed load, and and do so for the for the paleo valley. Okay, thanks. Thank you, John. So I think we have Vic Baker that wants to, uh, to ask a question directly. So Vic, I think you are unmuted, so you can directly ask a question if you wish to. Ah, uh, terrific. Uh, this is great, Vic. Now I should say Vic has just published a review on this site. So um, what do you think, Vic? 
Sounds like we have a lot to talk about. Um, so I think your presentation, which was excellent, uh, of course, uh, it touches mainly on the uh, tectonic and geophysical aspects. You didn't say a lot about the climate aspects, but those are rather massive because there was spectacular change from basically uh, tropical savanna landscape to the present arid conditions. The uh, modern gorge is associated with thick calcrete deposits. The ancient paleo meanders basically are ferrocrete cemented. They are, that material was derived from the old lateritic profiles that were extensive in the region. And that sort of clouds the picture of the nature of the sediments that were associated. Because as, as you point out, the quartzites in the old paleo meanders in the palimpsest uh, drainage, those are lag deposits. And as you also point out, those lag quartzites also exist in the broad upland surface, which uh, Jeff Pickup and I named the shoulder surface. And you refer to that as a very wide uh, expanse of the Fink before it incised it and then formed the uh, old, then formed the modern gorge, which is uh, a palimpsest related to the, to the old paleo meander pattern. That is a very reasonable mechanism for uh, having that occurred. And I think your uh, sort of uh, episodic tectonism is a, a reasonable idea. How that fits with the geophysics um, beyond just the, uh, or I, I shouldn't say geophysics. Uh, obviously, there's a relationship to the, to the uh, uh, gravity anomalies, which I think you've shown uh, rather, rather nicely. Uh, but how it fits to the up-down uh, sort of uh, uh, dynamic topography uh, that's created tectonically, I think there's still some mysteries there. You didn't mention uh, Michael Gurness's work from Caltech, uh, which basically is uh, an ancient subducted slab under Australia. This has been used to uh, infer some of the relationships in the, in the uh, eastern part of the continent. Uh, that's another player in, that, in this tectonic picture. Uh, and and I, I don't understand it myself, but uh, you and your colleagues, uh, I, I think, maybe have a chance to, to incorporate that into it. Uh, so um, I think I think there's there's more to the story. A another part you briefly mentioned is the um, differential erosion, which is spectacular in the area uh, between the resistant uh, sandstone ridges and the um, uh, and the other uh, uh, lower uh, areas, which probably were deeply weathered. Uh, creating a kind of process known as etch planation, but that's, that's older and prior to the, uh, to the uh, history related to the, to the paleomanders. So um, uh, as, as you say, I've written another paper about this, published rather obscurely in, the, um, uh, uh, in a Polish journal that was done to honor the death of uh, Leszek Starkel, a great uh, uh, paleohydrologist. Uh, another point I think though has to do with the stream discharges, which were, were mentioned. Uh, in the work we did 40 years ago, we were concentrated on the uh, extreme floods that are generated in central Australia by the occasional incursions of 
tropical uh, weather system. So th this, this makes for a, a uh, dynamic in the present environment of super extreme floods that are able to do a lot of sediment transport. That dynamic may have some association with how the modern gorge uh, was able to develop. Uh, that, that's also a, a something that's not clear. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the dating, which has uh, problems, um, would be uh, 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 something to be able to improve. Uh, in that regard, I wonder if you have considered some of the uh, techniques that are being used with uh, uh, paleomagnetism in uh, iron deposits. I think uh, Pillins has used this for uh, laterites. Uh, I wonder if that could be used for the calcretes in the, uh, not the calcretes, the uh, ferrocretes in the old paleo meanders. Um, sorry for the rambling <laughs> discourse. Yeah. But, uh, no, uh, I, I hope it uh, creates a flavor that uh, this is, as you've shown, one of the most fascinating landscapes in the world. And uh, I'm absolutely delighted that after more than 40 years, <laughs> people are uh, bringing new tools to it. And uh, your work is uh, pretty exciting in that regard. Uh, thanks so much, Vic. It's very kind of you to, to say those things. Um, of course, we're only building on the work that you and Jeff and others did in, back in the 1980s and, and before. Um, just to respond quickly to a, a few of your points, you're quite right that we haven't really nailed the role of climate. Um, I guess we were so convinced that the, these very strong gravity anomalies were having uh, effects with the in-plane stresses and so on that I described that they would overprint any effects of climate. But you're quite right that we, we uh, still need to maintain a, an open view on that. The main evidence against the role of climate that we went with was the very similar uh, geomorphometry of the Paleo Valleys versus the modern gorge. It's the same width, the same slope, and the same bed load calibre. So that, to me, felt that it was probably formed under a very similar uh, sedimentological and flow regime. And, I, and hence, I couldn't really reach for climate in, in those circumstances. But I agree that there's lots to be uh, sorted out with that. And you may be right that the iron-rich uh, concretions that we see cementing some of those basal conglomerates are telling us about uh, perhaps wetter or um, uh, warmer conditions. But we know iron being mobilized in, the, in deep uh, alluvial sequences is, is, can simply be driven by humic acids and redistribution by groundwaters. It's not necessarily a climate uh, proxy, I think. And you're right too that, um, of course, it was Mike Gurness's excellent work in 1998 that um, pointed to the, the sinking slab and that um, uh, Shellett and Stuckman in 2015, they're just, work, they're just building on, on Gurness's work. But as I pointed out, uh, there's a problem with the sinking slab theory, and that is that we, have, we seem to have an oscillation of the depot center, not a monotonic southward uh, uh, migration of, of the of the continental depot center in pace with plate motion. So DT, of course, has a lot to offer in telling us about the evolution, but I think it's it's maybe not the full story. Anyway, thanks again, Vic, for those great um, uh, insights. It's great well, to just, see you again, too. Well, just just one other point, if, if I may, about the uh, difference between the modern uh, gorge and the uh, ancient ancient one. The uh, hill slopes are totally different. The uh, modern gorge is, uh, has uh, steep faceted hill slopes. The ancient gorge is associated with rounded slopes, completely different morphology. 
it is as though the ancient gorge is associated with a uh, an ancient uh, savanna tropical morphology, and this is all on the uh, Krishoff uh, in the Krishoff ranges with with the uh, Hermansburg sandstone. So it's a lithology is the same. But the hill slope morphology being totally different, it's as though the relic uh, Miocene landscape is just there preserved because of the arid climate. And the modern gorge is one that is uh, associated with incision, perhaps uh, associated with the change to a very flashy uh, extreme flood regime where the extreme floods are dominating in creating the uh, the uh, the modern gorge. So th this is another idea, obviously <laughs> something that would require yeah. further work. But um, yeah, you're quite right. The, the hill slope morphology, the differences in the hill slope morphology were pointed out by Jack Mabbitt in 1967. And I think that it, while it may be the case that rounded uh, diffusional slopes uh, are perhaps more the result of weather conditions, but not always. And I think that we we can we can find diffusional rounded diffusional based slopes in very very arid settings too. I think the roundedness of the, the differences between the Paleo Valley and the, the modern epigenetic gorge may simply be a difference of time. The epigenetic gorge is relatively new. The Paleo Valley is very old. It's had a long time to round those. Those slopes, but we need to date them. Right? We need to do a better job than our cat handed uh, data set. We probably should let other people talk. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you, uh, Thank you, Vic. Thank you, John. Uh, I don't see any other questions, so if you have some questions, please uh, ask, ask them now. Uh, you can still also uh, use the mic if you want. Is still open. Uh, otherwise, I think we will uh, soon close this uh, talk. No questions? Okay. So thank you a lot, John, for, for this talk once again. It was very nice. Uh, so we will have um, a next uh, seminar next week with uh, Guy Paxman. So you are still welcome to, to join us. And I wish to all of you a good day and, uh, and see you uh, probably next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> that was really good. And, uh, and some really good questions from Vic. Vic, I guess we can just keep talking about it if you, if you want. <laughs>